All right, this is the topic today, and here's what we're going to start with. Um, this is probably the most famous line about equality from the Declaration. All men are created equal. So what did they mean? What did the founders mean? This is 1776. Genetically equal, physiologically equal, morally equal, economically, probably politically. These other ones are kind of silly. Everybody knows we're not genetically the same. But we also know they didn't think everyone had political rights. So to just be aware of this context when we hear this famous phrase, all men are created equal. Um, now, eventually, it was women and all races, but uh, in America at least. But uh, the conceptions of equality are important to distinguish. Now, here's a former president on the issue saying that the relentless decades-long trend is a dangerous and growing inequality and a lack of upward mobility. Now, but mobility is a separate issue from inequality, but they're related. And he says, this has jeopardized middle-class America's basic bargain. I'm on page three. Uh, the bargain was that if you work hard, you have a chance to get ahead. And he believes this is, quote, the defining challenge of our time. He says it's why he ran for president. He says it drives everything he does in office. And now he says, though, the, press, the premise that we're all created equal is the opening line. Well, we just saw the opening line. And while we don't now get this distinction now, while we don't promise equal outcomes, we have strived to deliver equal opportunity. And what does he define that as? The idea that success doesn't depend on being born into wealth or privilege, that depends on effort and merit. I'm not actually sure some of his political opponents wouldn't agree with that assessment. But is economic inequality truly dangerous? I'm going to look at some evidence today, uh, particularly from a professor from Harvard. Uh, but is it in itself dangerous or is it growing inequality that's dangerous? We're going to look at some Gini coefficients and showing that countries with growing inequality actually grow faster than ones that don't. Does that matter? Is that relevant? <clears throat> okay, so. Undoubtedly, we're not all created born with the same advantages or disadvantages. The question is whether this is a problem and whether it's a problem that can be solved by sacrificing other things, uh, maybe liberty or security or rights or prosperity. Is this just a cost benefit analysis? Aren't we doing this today actually with the, the virus issue? People are debating whether the economy should be shut down for the benefit of health or whether health should be you know, managed with the economy open. There's the same kind of debates going on, I think. Here are the readings for today. I'm not going to go through them in depth, just reminding you, make sure you read them. And I have a little synopsis for you. Don't rely entirely on the synopsis. You, know, you got to read the whole thing. Um, I'm trying to move ahead here. There's a synopsis for you. But again, don't rely on my synopsis. Make sure you read it, understand it yourself. But Vonnegut has a dystopia. Maybe some of you have read it already in high school. Other dystopias include Animal Farm. Uh, Ayn Rand wrote Anthem. But these kind of short novelettes worry about dystopias of extreme, in, uh, of extreme equality, mandated. Nozick is a well-known political philosopher from Harvard, the late Robert Nozick, a libertarian who criticized egalitarian theories, egalitarian distribution theories, because he thought they ignored how the distribution of income and wealth came about. In other words, what was the path? He said, you got to look at the movie, not a photograph in time to figure out whether people deserve stuff. So he offered what he called an entitlement theory of distribution, emphasizing something like this. The voluntary is presumptively just. You get that? The, that's a big presumption, but the voluntary is presumptively just, no matter how unequal the result might be, as long as it arises from voluntary exchange, that's okay. And we have to ban coercion as a result. If we want voluntary, presumptively just outcomes, we need to make sure things are as voluntary as possible. Now, Frankfurt Harry Frankfurt in 1987, 1987, he thought it was futile and actually potentially harmful for us to focus on people's relative socioeconomic status or level. And he said, you know, really what we should be doing is try to foster and raise the absolute level. And in other words, don't envy or worry about how different people are from you, just elevate 
I guess it sounds like rising tide lifts all boats, you know, rather than burn the yacht for the sake of the dinghy. Arneson now, Arneson is focusing on equal opportunity. And this, this we'll see is a kind of the middle ground between what I'll distinguish between equality uh, before the law and equality of result. I'll talk about those later. But the kind of intermediate position often taken is equality of opportunity. So he wants that. He wants equality of opportunity rather than, notice he says, rather than straight equality, meaning equality of result. And he said, because it's more, now notice the moral argument here, because it's morally fitting to hold individuals morally responsible for the seeable, foreseeable consequences of their voluntary acts. But those two, no, those two words are crucial. They have to be foreseeable and voluntary. But a lot of things are not foreseeable, like COVID-19, right? Um, so how much are people truly responsible for what happens to them and what's foreseeable? To the extent that is lessened, he might accept some equality of result, at least in part. Finally, Sen. I think I, re I, think I recall Professor Munger saying that Sen was his favorite was a political economist or political theorist, but Amartya, Amartya Sen won the Nobel Prize in economics. In the 1992 piece, he argues that much of the inequality we see in all sorts of out in genetic, socioeconomic outcomes, and by the way, whether they're positive or negative, are, are, are undeserved. Undeserved, why? Because due to inheritance, due to uh, or randomness even. So we don't pick our parents, that kind of argument. We don't pick our parents, we don't pick our genes, uh, but those are gonna be influential in the result. He advocates what he calls a capabilities approach to autonomy, to freedom, to justice. What are we capable of? And if some of us are incapable, we all need certain things to live, to flourish, to be happy. And he argues that typically the better abled or the better position should provide for those who are unable or disabled. And that's similar to Rawls, which I'll show you later as a little slide on Rawls. Now, I just want to go through four. I think I have four. It might be five. Very quickly, though, I want to remind you that there are really cool equalities, since we're talking about equality, in economics. So the most obvious one is equilibrium. So here's an equality between quantity supplied and quantity demanded, right? I told you in a prior lecture, prices are exchange ratios. So $800 for an iPhone, right? There's an equality sign there. If there's inequality, if there's di what economists call disequilibrium, that's a lack of equality, you can have a version that says surplus. Surpluses would be where quantity supplied exceeds quantity demanded, where the pressure would be for price to come down. But you can also have a shortage, we're seeing a lot of those today, a kind of disequilibrium, an inequality, which we should try to get rid of, right? where uh, in contrast, quantity demanded ex exceeds quantity supply, right? There the pressure would be for prices to come up and equilibrate, unless they're prevented from doing so, and then you stay with your shortage. So now another principle in economics is something called the law of one price, arbitrage, profit seeking, the idea of buy low, sell high, that actually ensures that the price of the same good is roughly the same everywhere in the world at the same time. That's just crazy. That's an amazing principle. Uh, adjusting, of course, for transaction costs. I, I wanted to put that in there because Dr. Munger says everything comes down to transaction costs, but also transportation costs. You know, and if exchange is left free, it's an interesting principle, equality. We often don't think of these equalities. Here's another one, Say's Law. Jean-Baptiste Say claimed, and the Keynesians deny, that when you aggregate everything up, not just micro markets at macro, that's why I'm calling this a macro principle. Aggregate supply equals aggregate demand, but actually not equals. Say said, it's the same thing. So I'm gonna use here an identity sign. There's a difference between the equality sign and the identity sign. He says they're the same thing, that supply constitutes demand, that it's the source of demand and they can never be out of balance because they don't really balance, they're the same thing. It's like looking in a mirror or two sides of the same coin. Over on the right, I just show you, just so you're aware, you'll get this in econ classes, the Keynesian model says no. Aggregate supply can sometimes exceed aggregate demand. There can be overproduction. There can be a general glut. And so the graph on the right kind of shows the Keynesian view 
as opposed to the Sagian view. And the Sagian view is this 45 degree line, of course, where the two must equal at all points. Here's another one. Oh, this is kind of old fashioned, Professor Munger will know, because Milton Friedman and the monetarists were very influential in the 60s and 70s, criticizing Keynes. Now, what's this equation? Notice we have another equation. There's equalities all over the place in economics. It's very cool. This is called the equation of exchange, where M is the money supply, V is velocity, but it really means money demand. P is the price level. So if it goes up or down, that's inflation or deflation. And T is basically transactions, but it really means real GDP. So now why is this? A, this is just an equation. This is, this is not really a theory. This is just saying things that add up or equal to each other. But it gave rise to a theory called the quantity theory of money. And the quantity theory of money says inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. In other words, caused by changes in the money supply not changes in the economy or other things. So a different theory of inflation, but counting on inequality. Here's another one. We, I just grabbed this from the prior couple lectures I did, the idea that there's a uniformity of profit principle. By profit here, I mean the profit rate. I think Professor Munger mentioned this in his last lecture. If profit rates are relatively higher, all else equal, risk equal, that kind of thing, all else equal, capital will flow to the higher profit rate area away from the lower profit rate area. But you can see by this ratio that that would equilibrate profit rates, a very kind of neat mechanism for capital flowing to the right place all over the world. So it's called the uniformity of profit principle. I wanted to show it to you because it's yet another equality. They're all over the place. Now, we won't go into this in great detail, but economists are very interested in something they call the Gini coefficient. What it measures is how unequal income or wealth is in any particular country, and 1.0 would be maximum inequality, and closer to zero, maximum equality. So this is a nice little graph. You can go check this URL later. This is a nice little color map showing worldwide which countries are, by this measure, more or less equal. <clears throat> All right, a little bit now on the effects. Okay, I'm gonna come back to the causes. But this is a very interesting, uh, Jenks is a professor at Harvard. Jenks is a long-term well-known scholar of income distribution, uh, equality and inequality. Um, and here's a New York Times coverage of some of his work. But notice, here's the New York Times describing it. As the income gap in the US has exploded over the last three decades, scholars in fields from sociology and economics to psychology and epidemiology, oh my God, epidemiology, that's a hot topic now, have tried to answer what turns out to be a difficult question. So what, what, so what, what, so what, what is wrong with inequality? What are the deleterious potential effects? And it said, quote, the most common moral arguments for and against inequality rest on claims about its consequences. And this is from Professor Jenks. Quote, if these claims can't be supported with evidence, skeptics will find the moral arguments unconvinced. If the claims about consequences are actually wrong, then the moral arguments are also wrong. All right, now let's think about this and see further. The New York Times summarizing it as, there aren't many social scientists in the US who have studied this longer than Professor Jenks. But about a month ago, he abandoned his 10-year-old project of writing a book about the consequences of inequality on what? On the nation's health and opportunity, on its politics, on its crime. Why? Why did he, quote, give up? Quote Jenkins, I came to see a book with six or seven chapters that all said the same thing. It's hard to tell. For all the brain power thrown at the problem in the past decade, specific evidence about inequalities, bad effects have been hard to find. Mr. Jenks said he could already picture the book's reviews. Professor doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, that would not be a first. Again, should it matter? Jenks, the most common moral arguments for and against rest on consequences. But listen, if there are no discernible deleterious consequences of economic inequality, 
uncovered by someone who looks for it all the time and specializes it, we might ask ourselves, why does it seem to worry and bother so many people that there's inequality? Um, if anything, maybe many social scientists, you'd say, would find positive effects from it. Um, maybe it does lead to the incentives more to create, achieve, prosper, be happy. So just a question to keep in mind. And how about this to keep in mind? This is the typical portrayal of the rich, corpulent. What does it say? What does that button say? The rich something. I don't even know. But that's my scratchings down below, where I say, is this the cause of the poor? And on the right, is that the cause of the rich? The zero-sum game premise stands behind this cartoon, doesn't it? It's the idea that one got rich because the others got poor. And the one in charge, of course, is the one that's rich. Now take a look at this. This is what I referred to before about growth rates and inequality. This is a measure of how unequal the income is in various countries, basically the top G7, I think it is, G7 countries. I went and found this data. It's actually in the economic report of the president uh, in 2017, page 60. Now, which one has been widening the most since 1975? The US, followed by United Kingdom, and the one with the least increase, France. But they're all increasing. The top 1% is getting a bigger, bigger share in all these countries, although it's gone down in you, you, United Kingdom. The data is five years old, but still, you get the idea. Now, the question is, what does this show or prove? It does show the sheer data, suppose the data are correct. It does show that the top 1% are increasing, but does it show that they didn't earn the increase? I mean, maybe they did earn the increase. And what's not shown is something I went and calculated myself that if you pick the fastest growers, those with the largest, excuse me, those with the largest increases in inequality, which is the US, Canada, and the UK, their growth was 25% faster than those who had lesser increases in inequality. So maybe inequality is just due to faster growing economies. Do we want to sacrifice faster growth in order to preserve uh, lesser degrees of inequality? Now I want to bring in here, this is now we're on page 17. By the way, I posted this presentation on Sakai as well. So it's already on Sakai in case uh, you want to retrieve it there later. Now remember the key principles of the evolution of cooperation. Axelrod's point that self-interest can lead to cooperation if there's repeated play. Remember iterated play. And what I call repetition, and he said develops a kind of reputation. So you have a reputation, you develop one over time, it's not a picture in time. You develop a reputation for good or ill for cooperating with people or not. And he has these five, four principles we know, but uh, here it's worth emphasizing the fourth one, don't be envious. Remember he says mutual gains are mutual gains after all, and they're not necessarily, in fact, they're rarely going to be identical gains. But his advice is don't begrudge those unequal gains. Don't begrudge those you deal with who happen to gain more than you do out of some kind of transaction Otherwise, you'll be prone to defecting and not cooperating. Now, these six books alone, I guess I could update it. These six books alone tell you that economic inequality uh, matters a lot to people. Now, in this case, especially uh, academics. So, but the themes are pretty similar. There's a cost of inequality, one says. There's a trap. There's injustice. Another one says, what can be done? So they're clearly not defending it. They're uh, warning about it. Now, here's a case where the language can get very slippery. Just a line taken out of the book. The richest 20% earn after tax more than, uh, I think that says 80% combined. Now, that seems like a shopping number because 80 is four times 20. But the operative word here is earn. I mean, is it really earned or not? If it's earned, what is the problem? If someone earns four times as much as somebody else, what is the problem? Or if some group measured as a percent earns three, two, four times as much as another, is it a problem if it's earned? 
or is it a problem only if it's unearned? So the question of whether it's earned or unearned is relevant, but it's hard to argue that if it's earned, it shouldn't be received voluntarily. Now here's on the issue of voluntarily, here's Professor Munger with a fascinating and recent piece. Others are clapping, I'm sure, not, not just him. I love this piece because uh, I, I have heard the same thing, this first line where he says, economists usually say, since exchange is voluntary, but the rest of the world says, if exchange is voluntary, exactly. That's what most people worry about. That's where they uh, most worry about inequality, you know, the consequences of it. If the consequences of it are uh, even seemingly good, but due to involuntariness, that troubles people. So the whole idea of the unearned, we'll get to this uh, later, the moral desert or lack of moral desert is very important. And Munger here is distinguishing what he calls truly voluntary versus what might seem to be only superficially voluntary. And he's got six conditions. So go check the essay if you haven't read it already. But the complaint even against this approach, he says, is people can't be trusted to choose for themselves anyway. All right, that's a slightly different argument, right? Or maybe it's related, but uh, chime in if you want, Professor Munger. But the, but the idea of Okay, I, it, I'm, it's voluntary, but I, I don't really make the best choice for myself. And maybe others should intervene and do something about this. But, but suppose even that's true. He goes on to say, oh my gosh, if that's true, if in marketplaces where people have their own money on the line, right? People are not making wise choices or they don't think they're voluntarily choosing. Why would that improve when they go to the ballot box? Why would the whole choice architecture be better in politics. In other words, if they're unfit to buy cereal, why would they be fit to pick a president? So it's just something to keep in mind here. If there's either two realms going on, or if we're going to have the same realm and the same premises, the same complaint against people in market settings would show in political settings. Professor Munger, do you want to say more about this? You're muted. I'm I, yes, I, not not anymore. Um, I'm I'm afraid I have to go for a second, but we'll come back to this. I have a response to several things, but I, I'm sorry. I okay. Now I have um, an essay that you might want to take a look at as well. This gets to the issue of inequality from a different angle, and here I point out that there seems to be a common recognition that uh, diversity, or if you will, inequality, that's really what it means. Diversity or variety um, are, are forms of difference, uh, forms of inequality, if you will. But diversity and variety, we know, are championed and applauded in things like um, entertainment, uh, any kind of competition, sports, the Olympics. We even call fans, uh, fans are fanatics fanatics who applaud and handsomely compensate, by the way, uh, the stars, the superstars, the champions, right? And yet in the realm of economics, in the realm of markets, in the realm of earning uh, our daily living, there is not that kind, there is not only not that kind of celebration, usually. I mean, maybe Shark Tank or something like that, but usually there's a either ignoring or a denunciation of difference when it comes to economic outcome. And the question is why? What is it about financial and commercial market activity, where if the res financial results are unequal, that isn't respected or applauded, but it is in these other realms. Something to think about. Now here are the three types of equality um, gathered from all the readings that I wanna give you that I think helps organize, might help organize your thoughts. So three types, equality before the law, equality of opportunity, and equality of result or equality of outcome, sometimes said. Now, how do these differ? And, and more importantly, not only get how they differ, think about as you read these, think about how they interrelate. Because if these are three types of equality that are all good, well, then maybe we can have all three of them. But what if they clash? Like, one, what if really endorsing one of them negates another one? Then we have a problem. We have a problem either of, well, maybe that's not really equality. 
or maybe that's not really the right priority. So we need to go a step further and figure out why is one having a priority over another? So equality before the law, that's the principle that citizens are to be treated alike in laws, before the courts, things like that. So in other words, there should be no special treatment or rights, but also no specific harms or rights violations that, that are put upon some individuals or some groups, but not other ones. And this is gonna be more typical of a, a, a more constitutionally living in government, a more capitalist type system where there's rights respecting uh, laws. But the idea here would be whether you are, if you're a murderer, it doesn't matter what gender you are, what color you are, what ethnicity you are. Equality before the law would argue that you should be treated similarly, okay? And what's being extracted out is what's in effect non-essential features, the very features that we have no choice over. Equality of opportunity goes beyond that and says, that although civil and economic rights are important, some citizens ought to be, some citizens' right ought to be abridged in some way uh, because they might be required to provide opportunities for others, all right? So you can have inequality of opportunity, but the question is how to remedy that. And if the remedying of it requires coercing some to help others, that's gonna violate number one. That's gonna, that's gonna stand in the way of equality principle number one before the law, you see that? This is a kind of a hybrid principle and usually supports not you know, purely capitalist type regimes, but more what they call mixed economies, middle way systems, welfare states, things like that. The last one, usually associated with something called egalitarianism is the idea, not equality before the law, not opportunity, but equality of result or of outcome. So this is the idea that all should have equal capacities, capabilities, income, wealth, and living standards, even if it would be lower in absolute terms than would be likely under the other principles of equality. So take a look at these when you have more time later. But again, the key here, not only understand the differences between them, but understand why they might clash and what's to do, what to do about that. Number two and number three, but especially number three, often tends to clash with number one. Libertarians, by the way, tend to endorse number one. Egalitarians tend to endorse number three. Moral dessert, I think Professor Munger referred to the other day, it has nothing to do with what you eat after the main meal. It's dessert in the sense of deserving or earning or meriting something. So it's a theory that says that individuals can be shown to deserve or earn what they get in their life for good or ill. Uh, whether it's psychologically, personally, economically, romantically, to the extent they have control over it. We don't have complete control, of course. It usually relies on an argument from free will, that we have free will, that we're responsible, we're accountable, that there's a causal relationship between what we're doing, what we end up with. And it has a, a concept of distributive justice. It's not against distributive justice. It just says you should get what you merit. And it does have retributive justice as well, which is the idea of crime and punishment. So distributive justice is getting rewards or income. Retributive justice is getting jail time or penalties for doing bad. This is different from legal entitlement, not quite the same as moral entitlement. So take a look at that later if you wish. How do you criticize moral desert? Well, you'd have to have some of what we had earlier. You don't truly deserve anything in life. Uh, not one's life, not one's features, personal qualities, friends. So these are seen as privileges that can be justifiably rescinded. Uh, how about the argument that no one chooses their birth status? Okay, that's a very common one. Some theorists contend also that much in life reflects randomness. It's just luck. It's just dumb luck, as they say, good luck or bad luck. The, the theorists might deny that people have free will. Okay, that's gonna make them less responsible for the outcome, right? And some theorists uh, focusing on the relative look at advantage versus disadvantage and ranking of people rather than absolute positions. So be aware not only what moral desert means, but what criticisms are. Now back to economics a little bit. There's a moral desert theory, yes? So um, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So one of the things that you had mentioned already about um, uncertainty or the fact that some of the consequences of our actions are things that we could not foresee might also be a criticism of moral desert. 
So we might have an implicit agreement that would say that we'll, um, we recognize that having a system that rewards people for seeking out new products is going to be beneficial and we will allow them, we will entitle them to keep what they have, and now I'm using quote marks, earned. But in a system where much of the difference in the rewards between the wealthy and the poor might be a consequence not just of luck, but of the fact that we have exposed ourselves to a global economy. So let's say that exposure to a global economy helps us most of the time. But yeah. sometimes it has catastrophic consequences, and we're seeing one of those now, the fact that we're so socially and in terms of travel and economics interconnected, um, we are exposed to the effects of a virus that has moved around the world with unprecedented speed. And it moves around across cities with unprecedented speed. So an argument instead that would be opposed to moral desert would be something like insurance. And so Ari Levine asked the question, what does it mean to truly earn your income? If you inherit $1 million and then through investment, you make more million dollars, is that additional income truly earned? So the, you have used earned as if it only reflects one of the two views of property rights that we talked about early in the semester. So the, the Lockean view of property rights means that I owe it and it would be a crime for someone to take it without my consent. But the other conception of property rights would be to say that property rights are collectively defined for the positive consequences they have for the society. And in fact, the wealthy might well sign off on that in if they were behind a veil of ignorance. So I don't know yet who's going to be wealthy and who's not. But because of exposure to the global economy, I know that some people, through no particular merit of their own, are going to win a lottery. And the lottery takes the form, I invest in some stocks or equities that just skyrocket, that go way up high. Now, it's good for people to seek that out. So we, should, we might want to agree that they get to keep most of the results. But that's different from they deserve to keep all of the results because they and no one else have earned them. So the distinction that I'm making is not so much about whether redistribution is justified, but what would be the reason that redistribution is not justified? So one might be we can't trust the political process to use the implied power responsibly. That polit political redistribution is going to be motivated by things other than justice. And so saying justice requires redistribution, you're not going to get that anyway. Or you're arguing that if, we've, if people have earned this, redistribution is not justified. Is it because they have an inherent moral right to those things and it is a moral crime to take it from them? So it's not a problem of implementation. It is instead a problem of, at its core that this is something that people deserve. And I, I wonder if you're really willing to defend the proposition given how many intrusions there are in the market and how much luck has to do with it. Now, in a, in a, I could imagine a society where those differences might be deserved or earned. Yeah. But in the present society, a substantial number of those are due to rent seeking or differences in opportunity because of the legacy of racism and the legacy of poverty. And so given that we live in a second or third best world, can you really say that it makes sense to say those differences are earned? So I'm flipping your question. If you can say these differences are earned, then maybe it's not unjust. Do you seriously want to argue that those differences are entirely 100% earned? Not just seriously, but humorously, yes. But let me follow on. That's a really good point. Let me say that I do think that to the extent these are principles drawn from an abstract ideal setting, the more you get the mixed system. I do think it becomes more difficult to disentangle who did what and who got what for what reason, your point about rent seeking or favor seeking. But what's odd about this is it's a kind of circular loop where if the theory is there should be redistribution for whatever reason, because there's unearning and unforeseeing, that generates a mixed system 
which makes it harder to figure out who did what. And so you can go down a very uh, kind of surfdom type path that way. I think the other thing I would say is, yes, this is not an easy thing to argue unless people believe in things like free will, responsibility, and stuff like that. But even if things come to you by accident, say by a lottery, it's always been interesting to me why lottery winners are not reviled as much as Wall Street millionaires, because that's luck. That's the essence of luck, to win the lottery. Uh, but people love to hear about lottery winners and things like that. The, the other issue is even in the redistributing, it's never been clear, it wasn't clear even in Rawls, that if the one who pays the taxes does so because they're undeserving, it's not clear why the recipient is deserving. I mean, short of simply being in need, which is not a small thing that matters to people, but the same kind of dessert type argument has to be applied to the recipient. And if the recipient is you know, really not working very hard or trying very hard or looking to foresee, it's hard to see why they would be deserving. Any chat yet, yeah, chat so criticisms? One, one yeah. more thing about yeah. that. Yeah. You basically just made implicitly a distinction we've made a couple times throughout the semester. And so let me emphasize it again. What you just said was that inequality per se might not be a problem. The problem is poverty. And so the absolute level of the difference, maybe that's something we're willing to accept if we can solve the problem of poverty. Yeah. And um, that means that those two things are usually equated. If we can split those two things off and say, what's the best way to solve poverty? And if the answer turns out to be a system that increases inequality, that is the use of markets, then we really are in a deep thicket. Because then you are, the people who really care about inequality for its own sake are against people who want to reduce poverty because they believe that markets, if you look at market systems, the, the places that poverty has disappeared, all without exception, have used markets. But they've yeah. increased inequality. Yeah. And so the, the, the difficulty that we face is, if you're going to say what about the poor, you need to recognize increasing inequality is the way to help the poor because that's how we get rid of poverty. You don't really care about the poor. What you care about is envy. What you care about is that some people have more than I do. That's a very different problem. Good. How are the chats going? I can't hear you. I will read them to you as they happen. Okay. <laughs> okay. The reason I want to mention marginal productivity theory, that's a mouthful, but to bring it back to economics a little bit. But notice, by the way, how we're going back and forth between moral theory, economic principles, politics. And I'm not sure you can understand any of this stuff with just one of those legs. You need three legs to the stool. Call it the PPE stool. Anyway, here, back to productivity theory, but this is a kind of relations to moral dessert theory. Marginal productivity theory is only about 120 years old. So it was in uh, 1900 or so that John Bates Clark came up with the idea of maybe people are paid for what they contribute to production. It's not arbitrary, in other words, that all sorts of income, whether wages, interest, profit, um, are earned. Now, what's the assumption that they're all productive factors, but differently so? So it's not just the Marxist view that only manual labor, say, contributes to the value of production that's produced and sold, where, whereas the Marxist view would say, you know, the less physicalist you are, maybe the more you're like a parasite. And now this is especially a problem for people if they see the white collar worker, so, so, so to speak, making more than the blue collar worker, because it strikes them as well, like not only are you not a true worker, um, you're making more than the workers. And even in the tax code, we know that if you report wages, that's called earned income. But if you report interest, dividends, and capital gains, the IRS calls it unearned income. So it's the moral description of your income is even in the tax code coming right out of moral theory. Anyway, one corollary of this theory is that no one who produces value 
under a free system is, is effectively overpaid, underpaid, or exploited, you know, over the long run. Corollary two, again, now this sounds like Nozick. The voluntary is presumptively just. The presumption is as long as there's a free market in labor, in capital, in CEO pay, in that kind of thing, the market for corporate control, that no third, fourth, or fifth party can, you know, rightly from the sidelines complain about who's getting what. The, core, the third corollary is that individual market players and receivers or income are going to be in the best position to judge uh, the value of other people's contributions, the value of other people's... Um, now, this is not... I, I don't know. Would you say, Professor Munger, this is actually more widely accepted in economics today than the labor theory of value? I mean, this is criticized sometimes, but isn't this the conventional view? Which one? Or, corollary two or three? Uh, just the principle itself, that people are oh, paid uh, marginal uh, product. It's certainly, that's true in economics, but economists... Yeah. I guess I would turn that around. Economists are people who believe that. So of course that's true. If your moral theory is based on the labor theory of value, then you're going to do something else. Yeah. So th this is partly that economics attracts people who believe in market systems and voluntarity to begin with. I do have to call attention to corollary two. Okay. You say the voluntary is presumptively just. You quite rightly started out with, in my opinion, my objection that economists always say since exchange is voluntary. Yeah. Well, that's what corollary two does. What if it's not? The voluntary yeah. is presumptively just. Yeah. What if most of our exchanges are not, we're not, we don't have equal bargaining strength. Right. So I'm a worker. I have no particular skills. I, I have a, a shovel. And so I'm going to be exploited by the fact that there's relatively few places for me to work because capital is much more concentrated in its ownership than labor. I'm just one worker. So there's a reserve army of the unemployed. You could put aside Marx's labor theory of value, but Marx's reserve army of the unemployed rests just on an assumption on an asymmetry of bargaining power. Right. If there's an, an asymmetry of bargaining power, that means there's degrees of voluntarity. So only purely voluntary is presumptively just. Anything that's less than purely voluntary, if there's some disparity in bargaining power, then it's not presumptively just. Then we have to argue about it. So corollary two proves more than it should in a world where voluntarity cannot be assumed but has to be demonstrated. That's very good. So we could say that a coda or an amendment to corollary two is that the involuntary cannot be presumptively just. We'd have to go further. Very good. That, that's, uh, that's worth changing that slide when I resubmit it. Very good. Thank you. He's keeping me honest, people. Have you noticed that? That's not easy with Salzman. Um, OK, this is from Clark himself. By the way, I think it's still true, isn't it, Professor Munger, that if you're 40 years or younger and you're a up and rising star in economics, Every two years you get, not every two years you get, every two years someone is rewarded the Clark Medal. And it's named after this guy. How interesting. The Clark Medal for brilliant, uh, I don't know why they cut it off at 40. That seems like ageism. But there it is, uh, the Clark Medal. It's named after him. So here he is saying in the 1899 book, I was off by a year, it's 1899, that the purpose of his work is to show that the distribution of the income of society is controlled by a natural law. And that this law, here's a big phrase, if worked without friction, oh boy, that sounds like with no transaction costs, would give to every agent of production, well, there are many agents, right? Cap, land, labor, capital, the amount of wealth which that agent creates. All right, so I won't read the rest of it, but you see wages there, traceable to labor, you see interests, traceable to capital. We might also say profit, traceable, so that you give a flavor of the guy who originated it, what he's talking about, a theory of deserving, even though he describes it in uh, economic terms. Yes, Professor. So, you said, of course, I'm going to be happy you work without friction because transactions cost sounds like something physical. But you could also say relatively equal bargaining strength. Yeah. 
So if, if there are unequal bargaining powers, there's also no reason to believe that this is going to happen. Now, the answer many economists would give is that the system does not have to be perfectly competitive. It just right. has to be competitive enough. Right. And then it's an empirical question, how competitive does it have to be? Right. Um, the, the, the market for professors is pretty competitive. We're grossly overpaid. The market for people who dig ditches, I mean, it happens. The reason I had to go a few minutes ago is that there's three guys outside who just got here and they're digging in the mud at my house. Uh -huh. And I'm going to make more in the next hour for doing this than they're going to make in the next day by yeah. busting their ass in the mud. Yeah. And there's different bargaining strengths for those three guys outside than there is for me. So is it really true that we can say that the value that's created by labor all goes to labor and so on if the bargaining strengths are fundamentally different? And I'm not expecting an answer to that question, but it is an objection to the marginal productivity theory is that working without friction really relies on not just the absence of transactions cost, but something like relatively equal bargaining strengths, or at least bargaining strength that is dissipated by competition. Yeah, and that is, to be clear, one of your six conditions for ou voluntary, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, even in cases where there might be an oligopoly, economists speak of contestable markets. So yes, there's only three companies here, but capital, fixed capital requirements are so high that this is an economy of scale. This is justified. Does this mean this oligopoly, oligopoly can exploit? Not if the market is contestable, meaning there are people on the sidelines that potentially could get in, maybe even through a change in um, the market for corporate control, but that requires there be no legal impediments. You know, it's just an economic barrier to overcome, but it can't be the government saying there shall only be three uh, providers. But that's a good point. Bargaining power is an important part of this story. Uh, I just wanted to show you this to give you three different cases and tell me which you like or don't like um, in terms of equality. Now, here's what I've done. I've just put factors. These would be factors of production, right? So A, B, C, and D. You know, A could be, A, B, C, and D could be different kinds of workers, or one could be capital and the other's labor and the other's raw materials. And now, and then I have two things next to them. So look at case one. I say, what if their product is a thousand? I don't know, a thousand what? A thousand units of something, a thousand widgets. And suppose that factor is paid a thousand dollars. All right, so if you work your eyeball downward and I ask, is there equality? Well, for case one, there's horizontal equality on the product side, right? And on the pay side horizontally, but not vertically. If you look up and down, there's obviously wide disparity in product and pay, but there's horizontal equity. Now go to case two, same factors. By the way, notice the bottom line, I've made it so it all comes out the same amount, one, 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 two. What's the situation in case two? Everyone is equally productive. There's no disparity between the factors. And they all get paid the same amount. Equality horizontally, yes. Equality vertically, yes. So notice how that's different from case one. I right, finally case three. We go back to the productivity distribution from case one. See that, 1,000, 100, 10, two. But we equalize the pay. We meld the two cases in effect. We get the productivity from case one, but the pay from case two. Now look down below. Horizontal equity, no, neither in product or pay. Vertical, no, but yes in pay. Okay, what is, what, what's the point here? The point is that case one, actually and case two, are more reflective of the idea of marginal productivity pay. And case three is a more egalitarian setup where, regard, put it this way, regardless of who contributes uh, X amount to production, they get paid the same. So now which of these would you consider just? I mean, I suppose you could also do this as student A, B, C, D, and the product is the grade they get. Well, not the grade they get, maybe the product of the essays 
the multiple choice, right? And then Dr. Munger and I pay them with a grade. In case one, we would be grading the student correspondingly with their performance. But if we were worried about equality of result over on case three, we would give everyone, what would that have to be, Professor Munger? We give everyone a B or a C plus, regardless of, I'll oh, please unmute yourself because I know you're swearing at me. What? What? Absolutely, C plus. <laughs> okay. You're a much uh, tougher grader than me. All right. I'm going to skip through these a bit quick, more quickly. We have, well, I, I think we have 20 minutes left, but I also want to give you a- May, may, I, may I say, yeah. I want to ask a favor. We, it happens we actually have a student who is in Santiago de Chile, and Chile is having some big problems with protests about inequality. So I would like to give, in 10 minutes, I would like to give her five minutes. Oh, great. Okay. So yeah, you, you really wave. only have 10 minutes. Yeah, just wave whenever you want to intervene. That sounds yeah. great. All right, so there are principles of conventional justice I wanted to alert you to, which relate to equality and uh, distinguishing it from social justice. And conventional justice, I don't know how else to describe this other than pre-social justice. And social justice is basically a concept that was developed, believe it or not, in the 1850s or so, so it's not that old. But conventional justice is the idea that we've already talked about, that people deserve or earn what they get in life. Um, and that luck, although it happens, um, doesn't really imply or impose any obligation on others to mitigate or compensate for it. You know, you could still have voluntary private charity, but it wouldn't be coerced. And now this conception of justice is much more rooted in Aristotle. It's much more rooted in enlightenment type ideas. And it's what's called the proportionality conception of justice. You know, five for five, three for three, one for one. That's what this was. That's what case one was, the proportionality idea. So Aristotle would say case one is totally just. Why? Because there's a proportion horizontally. And if you say to Aristotle, but yeah, but the pay is different. He said, yeah, but it's justified because people contributed differently. So that's a more Aristotelian um, enlightenment concept. Now, social justice, just so you know the roots of it, it's a more egalitarian principle, but it's the idea that true justice requires some kind of equality of opportunity and or result. I'll just blend the two. Uh, and then in policy, maybe necessitating certain redistributions. Uh, the little research I've done on this, the origin of the phrase is actually a Jesuit, um, Luigi <coughs> Caparelli. So Luigi Taparelli, a name you've probably never heard before, in the 1840s, drawing on the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, a great um, Middle Ages theorist of the Catholic Church, um, came up with the idea of social justice. Um, the phrase, in fact, social justice, and described it substantially similarly to what we have today. So if, if the roots or the origins interest you, there's also something called, oddly enough, liberation theology. It was very common in the Latin America in the 70s and 80s, I think a little less so now. But the liberation part was the Marxist argument that the workers to be liberated from the exploiting capitalist. And the theology part was the idea that Christianity also endorses this view and it was an attempt to blend the two which might sound very odd to people but you might want to think of this in terms of understanding social justice today it could have many tributaries well and to, to, to be fair the latin american version of liberation theology was in part devoted to trying to fight the u.s desire to prop up authoritarian right-wing governments that were torturing people yeah. Yeah. So liberation theology was, it, it's hard to study capitalism in South America as it was practiced by the United States with the United Fruit Company and say that no, it was colonialism. So liberation theology in some ways was opposed to colonialism and it's America's fault that colonialism and capitalism have been conflated that way. But I'm sure that I would have been um, a liberation theology supporter if I had been in El Salvador in 1981. Yeah. Anybody with a heart is going to support liberation theology if you live in a right-wing dictatorship that's a puppet government of the United States. 
Yeah, and so if the United States becomes a stand-in for capitalist exploiter, absolutely, yeah. Um, okay, this is a bit much, so I'm not gonna go through it, but if you wanna revisit this later, since we referred to Rawls, but he's not really in the reading list for today, but he's very important. He's a very important thinker, also a Harvard political philosopher, the late John Rawls, an enormously influential thinker, and someone that Nozick was trying to answer. So Nozick is in your readings. And when you read Nozick, keep in mind that he's basically trying to refute, in part, Rawls. So I thought, as a result, that I would give you a little bit of Rawls on slide 30. But Rawl, and, but just to summarize, the common critique of moral desert, which is coming from Rawls, is the idea um, that, well, we already mentioned this, that we don't really have full claim on what we end up with, and that justifies interventions of some kind. But I have a quote from Rawls there, and then also on the right, because I couldn't with, withstand it, um, some critiques of Rawls. But you can just excise that if you want and say that's just Salzman not letting Rawls totally speak for himself. But there's a lot of Rawls in there. Read it, it's good. So just to summarize, um, there's an egalitarian, more egalitarian conception of justice that requires equality of result. It might unavoidably require violating some other things like equality before the law. So libertarians might worry about that. Now, if that were true, egalitarianism might actually be unjust. But if the egalitarians are right that we don't deserve everything, they're instituting justice. So now this is different from the Aristotelian conception of proportionality. You know, the idea that merit and desert covering both distributive and redistributive justice. So that's somewhat repetitious, but I just wanted to summarize it there for you. Also, not to be too binary about this, but that's, that's what else I do. I do binary. I, I, it's either or for me, but I realize there are shades in between but this might help you uh, see better what's going on. This is a little more from Aristotle. Here he is actually saying proportion is equality of ratios. So, and there's an example down on the left from Professor Miller who writes on Aristotle's politics, but the essence of justice for Aristotle is this idea of proportionality and equality of the ratios. And we've already seen that before in the box example I gave you, case one, two, or three. So take a look at that. Notice how he says, justice is what is that virtue of the soul which is distributive according to desert. Now some people might think that's circular. Well, of course, if it's desert and deserved, it's just, but you gotta prove to me that it's deserved. All right, I'll skip over Barry. Now, I just wanna finish with something that is a total preoccupation of me, and I hope it's not boring to you, but what if we said equality, inequality, desert, not desert, has everything to do with our current tax system. When people hear taxes, then your eyes usually glaze over. I don't want to hear about it, you know. But here's a, let me show you quickly how it relates to the tax system. Because if you believe in proportional justice, if you believe in the marginal productivity theory, you tend to uh, sympathize with a flat tax. A flat tax, often called a proportional tax, not coincidentally. N namely, everyone pays the same rate, the same percentage. I'll show you an example soon. But that's well, what we, a flat we, we have two minutes means. What's that? We have two minutes. Two minutes. All right, let me show you my. T okay, and I'm describing three types of taxation, which go with three different conceptions of inequality and desert. But here's where it's summarized. And then I'll finish. I'll do this in one minute if I can. Imagine Scrooge, Minnie, Mickey, and Goofy. I'm partial to Goofy, so. But now look at the tax rate. This is an Aristotelian tax system. The tax rate is what? The same for everyone, 43%. That's a flat tax. Now everything else is just me running through what would they pay in taxes? What is their after-tax income? But then notice I also put in transfers. So I'm taking the money that's taxed and giving it back to them. But notice out of proportion to what they earn. Scrooge only gets 25,000 back. Goofy gets 100. 
So we're trying to equalize the result. And you can see their share of taxes. Now, even then, Scrooge pays 74% of the taxes down below, bottom line. Even though everyone's paying the same rate, of course, because Scrooge makes so much more. But now go to the next one. This is a graduated income tax. In other words, an upward rate, higher rate paid by Scrooge. This is a more egalitarian conception of justice. Now Scrooge pays at 50%, Minnie at 25, Mickey at 15, Goofy will only tax at five. That's the kind of tax structure actually we have today. But notice Scrooge pays still now 87% of all taxes. Uh, and some would say, well, yeah, that's because the rate's higher. But notice the share is not much higher than what he would pay under the prior flat tax system. And so economists might ask, well, if Scrooge is basically paying the same amount in total, maybe we should have a system like this one that isn't so disincentivizing to Scrooge. By the way, I'm going to assume that Scrooge is not just a miser, but he's out there in an entrepreneurial way creating stuff like masks and things. Okay, I'm done. I'm done, yeah. Professor Munger. Is that okay? That, that is terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you for the example. Ariadna, would you be willing to unmute your microphone and unmute your uh, video so that we can see you? Okay, can you hear me? I, we can hear you. Do, do, you have, do you have video? Uh, wait, let me see. Is it not working? Video? I am not seeing you. Oh, well, let me, let me just give an, a brief introduction. Um, you are, if you read any international newspaper, you are going to read about riots four days from now in Santiago de Chile. They have a, <laughs> a scheduled chaos riot every year called um, El Dia del Joven Cambiatante. So there is... The, there have been a lot of protests about um, inequality in Chile, and it, it's a shame we can't all be together, but it's actually nice in a way that we have a representative in Santiago, Chile, who can report a little bit on that. So Ariadna, what, is, what role has inequality played in, as you see it, the political problems that Chile is having? Um, sure. So my video is not working. Uh, sorry about that. So in the past months, uh, since October 2019, there have been a wave of protests in Chile. Uh, and one of the biggest issues uh, people are protesting against is the significant level of economic or income inequality between the top 1% and the rest of the population. Uh, and Chile currently ranks as one of the most um, unequal countries among the countries of the OECD. Uh, more so than the U.S. and Mexico. Um, so many say that these problems of, of economic inequality are rooted in the neoliberal economic model installed by Chile's dictator, Augusto Pinochet, in the 1970s and 80s, um, and that have persisted throughout uh, the return to democracy in the late uh, 1980s and 90s. Um, but it, it, it is important to know that Chile has been one of the uh, region's fastest growing economies in the past decades too, and the poverty has decreased significantly in the past uh, decades. So I guess uh, one of the questions can be to what extent can economic inequality be justified by economic growth? And that's one of the pressing issues right now. So what seems to me to be interesting, and if, if I read like El Mercurio or some of the newspapers in Santiago, it seems like the, you have to kind of reach a certain level of prosperity to start worrying about inequality. So yeah. there's inequality in a lot of countries, but I, it seems like, so I'm asking you to forecast, I guess, Ariadna. Mm -hmm. um, the, Chile has reached a certain level of education and prosperity, lack of poverty, and so it seems like prosperity is causing the unhappiness with inequality. That's actually a real political problem. So it's easy for rich people like me and Professor Salzman to say, well, inequality is not a problem. Yes, it is a problem if it <laughs> creates political difficulties that make democracy untenable. So is there a concern that the instability in Chile is actually going to threaten prosperity? Oh, yes, for sure. Yes. So the past months have been really unstable. Uh, economy, the economic growth that we have seen in the past decades have, has like, stalled in the past months. 
Uh, and I guess a big problem is that there's been a process of political the de, uh, is being de legitimatized uh, by the people. Um, and especially because I guess what you just said, so the middle class has been growing in the past decades and the poorer class has been decreasing. Um, and the political class has kind of dismissed the middle class and their issues. Um, yeah, so probably in the next few months or in the next year, uh, if the political class doesn't change their, um, yeah, their view on the middle class and stop like saying, you know, the poorest, uh, the poorest um, group of people are have been decreasing the past years, uh, and just like focus on the middle class and their issues. I think if that doesn't happen, I think uh, we will have a lot of problems in the next years, probably in the next months for sure. Well, I realize this is an unfair question, but. Chile actually has, by Latin American standards, a decent sized welfare state. So mm -hmm. there's something like a socialized medicine system and there's something like a universal pension system, which yeah. not all countries by any means have. So the, are the complaints about inequality or about expansion of the welfare state? So can you say a little bit about how the medical system works and the pension system works? Sure, so the pension system is private. Uh, everyone who works has well, to be. Well, it's private, employed. but it's mandatory. It's mandatory, yeah. So it's you have to be. Yes, it's, it's individualized. Individual. Yes. Um, and so everyone who works has to be affiliated to a private administrator that administers their pension system individually. And the healthcare and there's system. Some, there's some topping up of the very poorest. So it's not oh, yeah. what you put in. So there is oh, yeah. some redistribution in the pension system. Yes. And that has, I mean, that changed because before that it was private for everyone. Uh, that, that's, re that's a recent change. I think in the past five years it's changed. Yeah. Uh, and the healthcare system is uh, similar to the pension system, only that there's the option of, uh, so you have the private uh, system parallel to a public system too. So you can be either affiliated to a private administrator to your healthcare insurance, or you can be uh, basically administered by the state and be part of the public uh, administration. Uh, and I think that that's, oh yeah, that's a, uh, those two issues have been uh, a large part of the protests of the past months too. Um, so the, a lot of people are arguing against having a private pension system, especially because they can choose between having that or a public uh, administrator. Uh, and the, pension, and the pensions of the poorest and the lower uh, middle classes are horrible and miserable. People are living off of $60 a month in pensions, uh, which is nothing. Um, so yeah, it, that's a big problem too, for sure. Right, but Peru doesn't have any system of pensions at all, for example. So the Chile's mm -hmm. northern neighbor. Um, in many other Latin American countries, they have not achieved the level of prosperity required to have even a rudimentary welfare state. So what, what's interesting is that it is precisely the prosperity of Chile that has created unrest for two reasons. One is the sense that there's enough prosperity that they could do more to solve the problem of poverty. Mm -hmm. And the other is that the level of inequality, so if, if you drive around Santiago, it's an amazing first world country. If you drive around in the south or in some of the northern suburbs of Santiago, people are desperately poor. The level of inequality just hits you in the face. And it, yeah. it's sort of difficult to deal with because you think this is a rich country, why are there so many poor people? So the, the Chile, to me, is an interesting example. And the next couple of years are going to tell us a lot about whether a liberal capital system is sustainable politically because of the sense that many people have that this is fundamentally unjust and that something more is owed to the very poor. And whether that's in some way morally justified is, well, that, that's not really the point. The question is, in a democracy, what's going to happen? Professor Salzman. Yes, it strikes me that the Chile system, where 
people actually own their assets and accounts, you know, on the pension side, although granted it's you have mandatory contributions, very different from the US system, which is has no trust fund and pay as you go. But it it's interesting to me, apropos your comment, Dr. Munger, because it shows that economic status does not influence ide ideology. The very Marxist idea used to be that your relationship to the means of production, whether you owned it or were not owning it, determine your ideas. And even you suggested that a rich person today, of course, would have to endorse inequality because he's just trying to protect his own position. But here in Chile, we see that not happening at all. We see oh. people who are rich, uh, maybe not only the rich, but you're saying because they're becoming richer, they're uh, paradoxically also becoming more redistributionist. I remember my time on Wall Street being very surprised that most of my colleagues were um, Democrats or anti-capitalists. But then I would ask them, aren't you making a fortune? Many of them would say, I am, but I don't really think I deserve it. So and, they would have the same premises. Uh, and so their ideology was not coming from their pocketbook. Yeah. So who are we to argue if they think they don't deserve it? <laughs> well, so our, our, Ariadna, do you have any final thought? Um, well, I don't know. It's just inequality in Chile has been a, a big issue the past months, and I'm, you know, looking forward to seeing if something changes. Well, that's and it is. <laughs> the, the streets are going to be empty. Is it the 28th or the 29th, El Dia? Uh, 29th, I think. So the, the, the 29th of March, you're going to read about riots and a bunch of stuff being set on fire in Santiago yeah. de Chile. Yeah. And so I hope you stay safe. <laughs> I will. No worries. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And that's the end of class. I'm, I'm going to leave things up for a moment. If people want to chat, do you have any final thoughts, Professor Salzman? No, I don't. Thank you all for joining. That's it. Thanks very much. And put up chat questions and I will answer both of the first two. Thanks for coming to class.